The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka Chapter 1 Part 1 One morning, as Gregor Samsa was waking up from anxious dreams, he discovered that in bed he had been changed into a monstrous, verminous bug. He lay on his armor-hard back and saw, as he lifted his head up a little, his brown, arched abdomen divided into rigid bow-like sections. From this height the blanket, just about ready to slide off completely, could hardly stay in place. His numerous legs, pitifully thin in comparison to the rest of his circumference, flickered helplessly before his eyes. What's happened to me? he thought. It was no dream. His room, a proper room for a human being, only somewhat too small, lay quietly between the four well-known walls. Above the table, on which an unpacked collection of sample cloth goods was spread out, Samsa was a travelling salesman, hung the picture which he had cut out of an illustrated magazine a little while ago, and set in a pretty gilt frame. It was a picture of a woman with a fur hat and a fur boa. She sat erect there, lifting up in the direction of the viewer a solid fur muff, into which her entire forearm had disappeared. Gregor's glance turned to the window. The dreary weather, the raindrops were falling audibly down on the metal window ledge, made him quite melancholy. Why don't I keep sleeping for a little while longer and forget all this foolishness? he thought. But this was entirely impractical, for he was used to sleeping on his right side, and in his present state he couldn't get himself into this position. No matter how hard he threw himself onto his right side, he always rolled again onto his back. He must have tried it a hundred times, closing his eyes so that he would not have to see the wriggling legs, and gave up only when he began to feel a light, dull pain in his side, which he had never felt before. Oh, God! he thought. What a demanding job I've chosen, day in, day out on the road. The stresses of selling are much greater than the work going on at head office. And, in addition to that, I have to cope with the problems of travelling, the worries about train connections, irregular bad food, temporary and constantly changing human relationships, which never come from the heart. To hell with it all! He felt a slight itching on the top of his abdomen. He slowly pushed himself on his back closer to the bedpost, so that he could lift his head more easily, found the itchy part, which was entirely covered with small white spots. He did not know what to make of them, and wanted to feel the place with a leg. But he retracted it immediately, for the contact felt like a cold shower all over him. He slid back again into his earlier position. This getting up early, he thought, makes a man quite idiotic. A man must have his sleep. Other travelling salesmen live like harem women. For instance, when I come back to the inn during the course of the morning to write up the necessary orders, these gentlemen are just sitting down to breakfast. If I were to try that with my boss, I'd be thrown out on the spot. Still, who knows whether that mightn't be really good for me. If I didn't hold back, for my parents' sake, I'd have quit ages ago. I would have gone to the boss and told him just what I think from the bottom of my heart. He would have fallen right off his desk. How weird it is to sit up at that desk and talk down to the employee from way up there. The boss has trouble hearing, so the employee has to step up quite close to him. Anyway, I haven't completely given up that hope yet. Once I've got together the money to pay off my parents' debt to him, that should take another five or six years, I'll do it for sure. Then I'll make the big break. In any case, right now I have to get up. My train leaves at five o'clock. He looked over at the alarm clock ticking away by the chest of drawers. Good God, he thought. It was half past six and the hands were going quietly on. It was past the half hour, already nearly quarter to. Could the alarm have failed to ring? One saw from the bed that it was properly set for four o'clock. Certainly it had rung. Yes, but was it possible to sleep through that noise which made the furniture shake? Now, it's true, he'd not slept quietly, but evidently he'd slept all the more deeply. Still, what should he do now? The next train left at seven o'clock. To catch that one, he would have to go in a mad rush. The sample collection wasn't packed up yet, and he really didn't feel particularly fresh and active. And even if he caught the train, 
There was no avoiding a blow-up with the boss, because the firm's errand boy would have waited for the five o'clock train and reported the news of his absence long ago. He was the boss's minion, without backbone or intelligence. Well then, what if he reported in sick? But that would be extremely embarrassing and suspicious, because during his five years' service, Gregor hadn't been sick even once. The boss would certainly come with the doctor from the health insurance company. And would reproach his parents for their lazy son, and cut short all objections with the insurance doctor's comments. For him, everyone was completely healthy, but really lazy about work. And besides, would the doctor in this case be totally wrong? Apart from a really excessive drowsiness after the long sleep, Gregor in fact felt quite well, and even had a really strong appetite. As he was thinking all this over in the greatest haste. Without being able to make the decision to get out of bed, the alarm clock was indicating exactly quarter to seven. There was a cautious knock on the door by the head of the bed. Gregor, a voice called. It was his mother. It's quarter to seven. Don't you want to be on your way? The soft voice. Gregor was startled when he heard his voice answering. It was clearly and unmistakably his earlier voice. But in it was intermingled, as if from below, an irrepressibly painful squeaking, which left the words positively distinct only in the first moment, and distorted them in the reverberation, so that one didn't know if one had heard correctly. Gregor wanted to answer in detail and explain everything, but in these circumstances he confined himself to saying, "Yes, yes, thank you, mother." I'm getting up, right away. Because of the wooden door, the change in Gregor's voice was not really noticeable outside, so his mother calmed down with this explanation and shuffled off. However, as a result of the short conversation, the other family members became aware that Gregor was unexpectedly still at home, and already his father was knocking on one side door weakly, but with his fist. Gregor. Gregor, he called out, "What's going on?" And after a short while, he urged him on again in a deeper voice. Gregor, Gregor. At the other side door, however, his sister knocked lightly. Gregor, are you all right? Do you need anything? Gregor directed answers in both directions. I'll be ready right away. He made an effort with the most careful articulation. And by inserting long pauses between the individual words to remove everything remarkable from his voice, his father turned back to his breakfast. However, the sister whispered, "Gregor, open the door, I beg you." Gregor had no intention of opening the door, but congratulated himself on his precaution acquired from travelling, of locking all doors during the night, even at home. First, he wanted to stand up quietly and undisturbed, get dressed, above all have breakfast, and only then consider further action. For he noticed this clearly. By thinking things over in bed, he would not reach a reasonable conclusion. He remembered that he had already often felt a light pain or other in bed, perhaps the result of an awkward lying position, which later turned out to be purely imaginary when he stood up, and he was eager to see how his present fantasies would gradually dissipate. That the change in his voice was nothing other than the onset of a real chill, an occupational illness of commercial travellers, of that he had not the slightest doubt. It was very easy to throw aside the blanket. He needed only to push himself up a little, and it fell by itself. But to continue was difficult, particularly because he was so unusually wide. He needed arms and hands to push himself upright. Instead of these, however. He had only many small limbs, which were incessantly moving with very different motions, and which, in addition, he was unable to control. If he wanted to bend one of them, then it was the first to extend itself. And if he finally succeeded doing what he wanted with this limb, in the meantime, all the others, as if left free, moved around in an excessively painful agitation. But I must not stay in bed uselessly," said Gregor to himself. At first, he wanted to get out of bed with the lower part of his body, 
But this lower part, which, by the way, he had not yet looked at, and which he also couldn't picture clearly, proved itself too difficult to move. The attempt went so slowly. When, having become almost frantic, he finally hurled himself forward with all his force and without thinking, he chose his direction incorrectly, and he hit the lower bedpost hard. The violent pain he felt revealed to him that the lower part of his body was, at the moment, probably the most sensitive. Thus, he tried to get his upper body out of the bed first, and turned his head carefully toward the edge of the bed. He managed to do this easily, and, in spite of its width and weight, his body mass at last slowly followed the turning of his head. But as he finally raised his head outside the bed in the open air, he became anxious about moving forward any further in this manner, for if he allowed himself eventually to fall by this process, it would take a miracle to prevent his head from getting injured. And at all costs, he must not lose consciousness right now. He preferred to remain in bed. However, after a similar effort, while he lay there again, sighing as before, and once again saw his small limbs fighting one another, if anything worse than earlier, and didn't see any chance of imposing quiet and order on this arbitrary movement, he told himself again that he couldn't possibly remain in bed, and that it might be the most reasonable thing to sacrifice everything if there was even the slightest hope of getting himself out of bed in the process. At the same moment, however, he didn't forget to remind himself from time to time of the fact that calm, indeed the calmest, reflection, might be better than the most confused decisions. At such moments he directed his gaze as precisely as he could toward the window, but unfortunately there was little confident cheer to be had from a glance at the morning mist, which concealed even the other side of the narrow street. It's already seven o'clock, he told himself at the latest striking of the alarm clock, already seven o'clock and still such a fog. And for a while he lay quietly with weak breathing, as if perhaps waiting for normal and natural conditions to re-emerge out of the complete stillness. But then he said to himself, Before it strikes a quarter past seven, whatever happens, I must be completely out of bed. Besides, by then someone from the office will arrive to inquire about me, because the office will open before seven o'clock. And he made an effort then to rock his entire body length out of the bed with a uniform motion. If he let himself fall out of bed in this way, his head, which in the course of the fall he intended to lift up sharply, would probably remain uninjured. His back seemed to be hard. Nothing would really happen to that as a result of the fall. His greatest reservation was a worry about the loud noise which the fall must create and which presumably would arouse, if not fright, then at least concern, on the other side of all the doors. However, it had to be tried. As Gregor was in the process of lifting himself half out of bed, the new method was more of a game than an effort. He needed only to rock with a constant rhythm. It struck him how easily all this would be if someone were to come to his aid. Two strong people, he thought of his father and the servant girl, would have been quite sufficient. They would have only had to push their arms under his arched back to get him out of the bed, to bend down with their load, and then merely to exercise patience and care that he completed the flip onto the floor, where his diminutive legs would then, he hoped, acquire a purpose. Now, quite apart from the fact that the doors were locked, should he really call out for help? In spite of all his distress, he was unable to suppress a smile at this idea. He had already got to the point where, by rocking more strongly, he maintained his equilibrium with difficulty, and very soon he would finally have to decide, for in five minutes it would be a quarter past seven. Then there was a ring at the door of the apartment. That's someone from the office, he told himself, and he almost froze while his small limbs only danced around all the faster. For one moment, everything remained still. They aren't opening, Gregor said to himself, caught up in some absurd hope. But of course then, as usual, the servant girl from her firm tread went to the door and opened it. Gregor needed to hear only the first word of the visitor's greeting to recognize immediately who it was. The manager himself. Why was Gregor the only one condemned to work in a firm where, at the slightest lapse, 
someone immediately attracted the greatest suspicion. Were all the employees then collectively, one and all, scoundrels? Among them was the there then no truly devoted person who, if he failed to use just a couple of hours in the morning for office work, would become abnormal from pangs of conscience and really be in no state to get out of bed? Was it really not enough to let an apprentice make inquiries, if such questioning was even necessary? Must the manager himself come, and in the process must it be demonstrated to the entire innocent family that the investigation of this suspicious circumstance could be entrusted only to the intelligence of a manager? And more of a consequence of the excited state in which this idea put Gregor than as a result of an actual decision, he swung himself with all his might out of the bed. There was a loud thud, but not a real crash. The fall was absorbed somewhat by the carpet, and, in addition, his back was more elastic than Gregor had thought. For that reason the dull thud was not quite so conspicuous. But he had not held his head up with sufficient care, and had hit it. He turned his head, irritated and in pain, and rubbed it on the carpet. Something has fallen in there said the manager in the next room on the left. Gregor tried to imagine to himself whether anything similar to what was happening to him today could have also happened at some point to the manager. At least one had to concede the possibility of such a thing. However, as if to give a rough answer to this question, the manager now, with a squeak of his polished boots, took a few determined steps in the next room. From the neighbouring room on the right, the sister was whispering to inform Gregor, "'Gregor, the manager is here.' "'I know,' said Gregor to himself, but he did not dare make his voice loud enough so that his sister could hear. "'Gregor,' his father now said from the neighbouring room on the left, "'Mr. Manager has come and is asking why you have not left on the early train. "'We don't know what we should tell him. "'Besides, he also wants to speak to you personally. "'So please open the door.' He will be good enough to forgive the mess in your room. In the middle of all this, the manager called out in a friendly way. Good morning, Mr. Samsa. He is not well, said his mother to the manager, while his father was still talking at the door. He is not well, believe me, Mr. Manager. Otherwise, how would Gregor miss a train? The young man has nothing in his head except business. I am almost angry that he never goes out at night. Right now he has been in the city eight days, but he has been at home every evening. He sits here with us at the table and reads the newspaper quietly, or studies his travel schedules. It's quite a diversion for him to busy himself with fret work. For instance, he cut out a small frame over the course of two or three evenings. You'd be amazed how pretty it is. It's hanging right inside the room. You'll see it immediately, as soon as Gregor opens the door. Anyway, I'm happy you're here, Mr. Manager. By ourselves we would never have made Gregor open the door. He's so stubborn, and he's certainly not well, although he denied that this morning. I'm coming right away, said Gregor slowly and deliberately, and didn't move so as not to lose one word of the conversation. My dear lady, I cannot explain it to myself in any other way, said the manager. I hope it is nothing serious. On the other hand, I must also say we business people, luckily or unluckily, however one looks at it, very often simply have to overcome a slight indisposition for business reasons. So, can Mr. Manager come in to see you now? asked his father impatiently, and knocked once again on the door. No, said Gregor. In the neighbouring room on the left, a painful stillness descended. In the neighbouring room on the right, the sister began to sob. Why didn't his sister go to the others? She'd probably just got up out of bed now, and hadn't even started to get dressed yet. Then why was she crying? Because he wasn't getting up, and wasn't letting the manager in, because he was in danger of losing his position, and because then his boss would badger his parents once again with the old demands. Those were probably unnecessary worries right now. Gregor was still here, and wasn't thinking at all about abandoning his family. At the moment he was lying right there on the carpet, and no one who knew about his condition would have seriously demanded that he let the manager in. But Gregor wouldn't be casually dismissed right away because of this small discourtesy, for which he would find an easy and suitable excuse later on. It seemed to Gregor that it might be far more reasonable to leave him in peace at the moment, 
instead of disturbing him with crying and conversation. But it was the very uncertainty which distressed the others and excused their behaviour. Mr. Samza, the manager was now shouting, his voice raised, what's the matter? You are barricading yourself in your room, answer only with a yes and a no, are making serious and unnecessary troubles for your parents, and neglecting, I mention this only incidentally, your commercial duties in a truly unheard of manner. I'm speaking here in the name of your parents and your employer, and I am requesting you in all seriousness for an immediate and clear explanation. I am amazed. I am amazed. I thought I knew you as a calm, reasonable person, and now you appear suddenly to want to stop parading around in weird moods. The chief indicated to me earlier this very day a possible explanation for your neglect. It concerned the collection of cash entrusted to you a short while ago. But in truth, I almost gave him my word of honour that this explanation could not be correct. However, now I see your unimaginable pig-headedness, I am totally losing any desire to speak up for you in the slightest. And your position is not at all the most secure. Originally, I intended to mention all this to you privately. But since you are letting me waste my time here uselessly, I don't know why the matter shouldn't come to the attention of your parents. Your productivity has been very unsatisfactory recently. Of course, it's not the time of year to conduct exceptional business. We recognise that. But a time of year for conducting no business? There is no such thing at all, Mr. Samsa, and such a thing must never be. But, Mr. Manager, called Gregor beside himself and, in his agitation, forgetting everything else, I'm opening the door immediately, this very moment. A sight in disposition, a dizzy spell, has prevented me from getting up. I'm still lying in bed right now, but I'm quite refreshed once again. I'm in the midst of getting out of bed. Just have patience for a short moment. Things are not going as well as I thought, but things are all right. How suddenly this can overcome someone. Only yesterday evening, everything was fine with me. My parents certainly know that. Actually, just yesterday evening, I had a small premonition. People must have seen that in me. Why have I not reported that to the office? But people always think that they'll get over sickness without having to stay at home. Mr. Manager, take it easy on my parents. There is really no basis for the criticisms which you're now making against me. And really, nobody has said a word to me about that. Perhaps you have not read the latest orders which I shipped. Besides, now I'm setting out on my trip on the eight o'clock train. The few hours' rest will have made me stronger. Mr. Manager, do not stay. I will be at the office in person right away. Please have the goodness to say that and convey my respects to the chief. While Gregor was quickly blurting all this out, hardly aware of what he was saying, he had moved close to the chest of drawers without effort, probably as a result of the practice he had already had in bed, and now he was trying to raise himself up on it. Actually, he wanted to open the door. He really wanted to let himself be seen and to speak with the manager. He was keen to witness what the others, now asking about him, would say when they saw him. If they were startled, then Gregor had no more responsibility and could be calm. But if they accepted everything quietly, then he would have no reason to get excited and, if he got a move on, could really be at the station around eight o'clock. End of chapter 14